I heard from an NFL GM one time told me that um, you may think too much on the field. Like if we're asking you to run through a wall because you're smart, because you want to be a brain surgeon, because maybe one day you can be a president or something like that, you may not run through that wall. You may try to protect yourself. Whereas another guy who has no other option, uh, who needs this, who may not be as talented as you, he's going to run through that wall and do everything we say because this is all he's got. He's going to give it everything he's got. And I, and I couldn't stand that narrative, and I could never shake that when I got to the NFL. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Dr. Myron Roll, you were a brain surgeon at Harvard Medical School, an All-American football player at Florida State, a Rhodes Scholar, and a sixth-round draft pick in the NFL. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us on our podcast today. It's an honor to have you. Thank you for having me. When uh, Dr. Sokovich told me you were there, she's like, you know, Troy, you're not going to believe this. There's this guy who's got a background. It's kind of like your dad's. And I'm like, I've never heard that before. Who could could it be? She's like, yeah, he played in the NFL and he stopped and he went into uh, brain surgery. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I knew right away. And then she said you were there. So that's awesome. Yes. You grew up the youngest of five boys. Were your brothers rough on you or did they baby you? It seems like there's never an in-between. <laughs> they were they were, they were were hard on me, for sure. Um, but I think they were hard because uh, they saw potential in me and they wanted to make sure that I had um, all the, the guidelines to be uh, successful. You know, my family came from the Bahamas and... Um, you know, my parents were very adamant that we, as brothers, stuck together, stuck together, and we looked after each other, we supported each other, we watched each other's games, we went to each other's, you know, concerts, and you know, whatever it is that we did, we sort of did it as a group and as a pack. And so, my brothers, um, they saw that uh, I had intellect and I was fast and I was big and strong and having success on the field. So, they were protectors, they were buffers. I mean parties, drugs, alcohol, girls, all that stuff. I mean, they uh, shielded me. Uh, <laughs> and they were they were like, you're not you're not going to um, get distracted by some of these temptations that they did, frankly. I mean, I'm going to be frank. They did some of those things, but they were like, you're different. And um, I actually appreciate them for that because, you know, it, it, I had some friends growing up uh, that were probably more athletic than me but didn't have the structure, discipline, or the family support. And they got lost to some of those fleshly and worldly sort of temptations that got them off off track. Um, did, did poorly in school, wasn't eligible to play, never got a scholarship, and just sort of fell off. Uh, but my brothers were, um, were uh, pivotal for, for my success. And during my teenage and development years, it was – it was crucial to have them in my corner. And I I tell them all the time, any success that I have now, I owe it to them for the kind of discipline that they instilled in me. That's awesome. Your house must've been crazy with five boys. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. It was nuts. It was nuts. (laughs) Were your parents strict when you were growing up or was it more your brothers? Uh, They left a lot of it to my brothers. I mean, they, they, uh, they were sort of like the final boss, right? Like the brothers did (laughs) most of the disciplining uh, and most of the rearing. And then, you know, if there was something that was very extreme or something that went way across the line. Then my parents stepped in and said, okay, this is not going to happen. But, um, you know, my mommy and daddy met when they were eight years old, dated at 15, married at 21 in the Bahamas. And they knew that 
the Bahamas is a great country. We love it dearly. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to us. Uh, but there was limited resources there. And coming to America was a time for us to be great at whatever it is we chose to be great at. It felt that there was abundance of resources and unlimited potential for us if we were good students, good leaders, good Christian, good men, um, just did the right things that we could accomplish our goals. Whereas the Bahamas might have had a ceiling, America had, you know, almost no ceiling on our growth. And so uh, there, there wasn't a lot of time to sort of um, – be complacent with this opportunity or play around or do anything that would like not be success, do anything that was not sort of moving forward. And uh, my parents sort of laid that groundwork and my brothers executed that groundwork for me personally. What's the age range with uh, you and your brothers? My oldest brother is 16 years older than me. Uh, oh, and there is one that's 14 years, 13 years. And I have one that's very close to me. He's three years older than me. So, but the oldest three, they were like, yeah, they were tough. And then the one right above me, he sort of assumed the toughness role of the older ones. And uh, <laughs> but but it, it's amazing. We're very very tight. Uh, we have a group text and we talk every single day. And today's actually the birthday of my oldest twins. And so all my brothers have been reaching out to me uh, to tell my twins happy birthday. And so it's a, we're a very tight family. You are Bahamian American. What does that mean to you? Is it just that you have two passports or do you still have family there that you visit? I, I So I have two passports. Um, I currently live in Orlando. I've been in Orlando and Central Florida for about 10, 15 years now. Uh, so I call Orlando home, but uh, I do have family still in the Bahamas. Most of my family is actually still there. Aunts, uncles, cousins, my god uh, son, my goddaughter are there. Um, you know, my um my godfather is still there. Uh, people who grew up with us, my church home, uh, you know, I have a very good church home in Orlando, but also one in the Bahamas. So we're still very connected to the country. Um, we go every Christmas and Boxing Day uh, to celebrate um, one of our festivals called Junkanoo, which is one of our big sort of cultural expressions where we wear fancy clothes and uh, go dance on the street and you know, have a really good time. It's, it's, it's like a carnival, but it's sort of more tamed, uh, but it's our big sort of cultural event for the year. So we, we love to go there for that. And I love to bring my kids back to the Bahamas so they get to dip their feet in the beautiful water and the pink sand and swim at pigs and do all the kind of cool stuff that we, that I did as a child. And now trying to, you know, um, introduce that to my kids has been awesome. How old were you when you guys uh, moved? I was uh, three years old, so very, very young. Yeah, but some of your siblings were were older, so that's so it was a pretty big culture shift for your family then. Definitely, yeah. The siblings were older, uh, and then you know, even after we moved permanently from the Bahamas to America, we would go back and forth to the Bahamas every summer. As soon as school finished in America, we go to the Bahamas and spend all summer there. And then a week before school started back in America, we come back to the U.S. and uh, and spend time there. So. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was great to have a foot in both countries. Uh, the Bahamas is only 400,000 people. 21 by 7 is New Providence, Nassau, where our main uh, island, our main capital. Um, you know, about 500, you know, islands and keys, um, but only, you know, roughly 20 or 30 of them are, are uh, inhabited. And so it is, um, it's a beautiful place. It's paradise for sure. And one thing my parents did, which I love, is they never let us forget um, our family in the Bahamas and our culture, uh, the national heroes that we had, some of the national holidays that we celebrated. So we never really felt disconnected from our DNA. Uh, we always felt, even though we were in America and taking advantage of the opportunities that this beautiful country of America had to offer us, we still had, you know, we're still plugged in uh, to the Bahamas for sure. What was it like growing up in Galloway, New Jersey? Did you live in the suburbs or was it rural? What did your parents do for work? Yeah, Galloway, uh, New Jersey is a suburb of Atlantic City. Uh, it's about 20 minutes from uh, Atlantic City in southern New Jersey. And we chose there because my father's sister was living there. And my daddy got a job in New York City. Uh, and my mummy said, when we're moving from the Bahamas, is either we're going to New York or New Jersey. Um, because daddy also got a job offer in Luxembourg in Europe. And she was like, I don't want to be in Europe. Like we're going to America, so so we decided to choose Galloway. Um, again, close to close to New York, where Daddy could commute 
uh, daily. And, um, and yeah, it was a, it was a good town. It really was. It was a town that was by 80% white, uh, maybe about, you know, five to 10% black. And then you had other ethnicities there. There was a lot of Catholic influence in uh, Galloway, New Jersey. Uh, most of the people who lived there worked in the casinos, Trump Plaza, Trump Taj Mahal, Trump Marina, Tropicana, Borgata, Showboat, you know, all of these hotels, like in Caesar's Palace, like, I mean, all the boxing matches that happened like in the 90s and stuff, we were, you know, right there. I mean, Holyfield, Tyson, just all these cool events are in AC. The Miss America pageant, Donald Trump had a huge influence in that and brought it to Atlantic City. So most of the residents of Galloway worked in the casinos. My parents, one of my parents worked in the casinos, my mother. She was a, uh, a secretary at Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino. Uh, but my father uh, worked at Citibank as a senior systems engineer. He was very much into IT. He got his undergraduate degree uh, at St. Thomas University uh, up in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. So um, so he had spent some time in the U.S. already. But, um, but yeah, no, I think the town was, was good. It was... Um, it was one where I, you know, cut my teeth in football and basketball, baseball, all the sports. The educational system was great. I still talk to my teachers from Galloway. Uh, they still are close to me. They came to my wedding. Uh, they came to my graduation. Uh, so they're they're very close to me, and I, I I owe them a lot because they put books in my hands and inspired me to want to think about, you know, education as an avenue for success rather than just running fast and scoring touchdowns on a football field. What teachers, like what classes were they for? I'm so curious. Yeah. So my science teacher, Miss Manganello, I still remember her to this day in fifth grade. She says, you know, you're very good at science. Like you get it. You know, you're, you're like the concepts come to you re- relatively easy. You should think about a career in science, maybe being a doctor. And I was like, all right, uh, cool. And then my principal actually, uh, she was, my principal's name is Miss Giaquinto, Annette Giaquinto. Uh, she had me, involved in student government, had me involved in um, Habitat for Humanity, the Think Team, where we did different brain brawl competitions around uh, the community, got me involved in volunteering at our nursing home, uh, where I was playing the baritone saxophone for some of our nursing home residents nearby. Uh, She really wanted me to be a leader and to think about how I can engage with different communities. I already mentioned our town was around 80% white. like I said, there was Catholics, there were um, Pakistanis, there were Koreans. Uh, There's all different sort of cultures in the other group. And so she was like, engage with all these groups, engage with the drama kids, engage with the jocks, engage with the people writing for the newspaper uh, who want to volunteer for Habitat for Humanity, who are the merit scholars, like engage with all these different individuals uh, because I see a leader in you, Myra. She was the first person, in my opinion, who I think unlocked the, the charisma and the sort of what I use now in my bedside manner to sort of engage with people, uh, to understand people, to listen to people and to uh, enjoy the differences, the cultural differences that exist among unique individuals. And um, I, I really appreciate her for that. We're still very close to this day. I know my, my dad had good relationships with his teachers too. My teachers wouldn't take my call if they pretend they didn't know me if they saw me. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not supposed to talk politics, but this is nothing left unsaid. Did your mom working at one of Trump's companies push you towards being a Trump supporter? <laughs> uh, I, I am uh, I am not a Trump supporter. Um, you know, I voted for um, Barack Obama, Joe Biden. Um, you know, I've voted pretty much uh, liberal. Um, uh, for the majority of, of my life, uh, I think Donald Trump has, um, you know, he had a, a role in in my childhood because he was such a prominent figure uh, in Atlantic City, New Jersey growing up. And so you saw his name and there was a certain sort of um, allure with, with, with his presence. I mean, my mother would tell me that when he would walk through the hotel, it was like the Beatles walking. I mean, people following him, uh, people wanting to be next to him. And so you had that sort of magnetism then, and you see it now uh, in the current election we're in and the people who follow him. He's got, you know, the ability to attract and uh, have people gravitate towards him. And um, I think that was evident even earlier when he wasn't really interested in politics. But 
Um, you know, I, for me personally, I, I'm not a not a supporter of them. <laughs> you sang in the school play, played the saxophone, and you were the sports editor for the school paper, all while crushing athletics, playing football, basketball, and track. Is there anything that you couldn't do? <laughs> Well, uh, I appreciate that. You know, I, I enjoyed uh, being um, well-rounded and having, you know, um, fun with it all, not feeling boxed in. I never really wanted somebody to say you're just an athlete uh, or you're just a student. I always thought there was an and to it. I'm an athlete and a student, a student and a leader, a leader and a musician, a musician and a thespian you know, whatever I can do to sort of continue to stay busy, but also continue to have fun and continue to push myself, uh, push my limits. Uh, it was fantastic. And I never was afraid of embarrassment either. I mean, I know I'm not a great singer, so maybe that's one thing I can't do. I can't sing very well, but I tried out for the lead role in Fiddler on the Roof as Tevya, and I made it. And um, and I think it was just hard work and the the ability to say, look, I know I'm not great at this, but I'm going to work. I'm going to uh, try to refine this craft, uh, and I'm not going to feel uh, ashamed of my presence. Frankly, the performance of it all was more about the emotion and more about the the energy that I was putting into the role than if I sang like Luther Vandross or you know Whitney Houston. I, that didn't really matter. Uh, and I think that confidence came from my parents, my brothers, telling me as a young man. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Uh, we believe in you. And once you put into your in your mind that you can accomplish this goal, then um, it's going to come to to fruition. And uh, that's all I needed. That was like the the green light, the neon green light to go and pursue all of these different activities. And I enjoyed each and every one of them. That's so cool. I, lo I love too the principal telling you like to push into new groups and new boundaries and do new things. It's like such a perfect recipe of support from your family and then also hearing it from an outsider almost gives it more validation because you know your parents love you and you know always say you're special for everybody but hearing it from an outsider it's just that's really cool yeah and now definitely. i see too i didn't know all that stuff so now i get why merit's connection was saying why this would be such a good fit the <laughs> two of you guys are like modern day renaissance men <laughs> yeah you transferred from your local high school to the prestigious Hun School in Princeton. There you ended up ranked by ESPN as the number one football recruit in the country, all while maintaining a perfect 4.0 GPA. Did you find it difficult to balance sports and school? Or are you one of those people who didn't even have to study much? Uh, you know, I didn't find it difficult. I did not find it difficult to, to do that balance. Um, because it was something that my parents had and my brothers had um, sort of uh, nurtured as a young man. It was it was a part of our, our 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 youth and our childhood that we would be involved in many things. We'd go to church on Sunday and we'd travel. We'd play this game. We'd do this activity. Uh, but at the end of the day, you had to get your work done, and that was a priority. Time management was important. Um, and making sure that you worked on your projects or your homework or study for your tests or exams weeks in advance so that you were really equipped and prepared. And so I thought going to the Hunt School and um, playing three sports and maintaining that GPA, uh, that sort of came natural after practicing it as a routine for so many years before that. Uh, and so even and, – and the Hunt School – as well as the petty school, but the Hun school was a place, it's a boarding school. So there are no um, parents like waking you up in the morning and saying, go to school, uh, iron your clothes, uh, go to breakfast. You have to do it on your own. You get up on your own, you study on your own, you become a woman or a man quickly. Uh, you kind of grow out of that boy phase and, and, you know, become your own person uh, that has to sort of um, take initiative and I, I think I was ready for that. Actually, I know I was ready for that. And that prepared and propelled me into college because when I went down to Florida State, which is you know thousands of miles away from New Jersey, uh, I was already used to being on my own and making independent decisions that would behoove my interests as a scholar athlete. 
uh, and the balance didn't really um, pose a challenge for me. Why did you ultimately end up choosing to go to Florida State? You could have gone to any school in the nation. Weren't you tempted by some place like Harvard? If Harvard could have given out athletic scholarships, I probably would have ended up there when I was picking schools. Yeah, I looked at the Ivies, but not very long because uh, <laughs> I wanted to play big time college football. I really did. I, you know, I wanted to be on ABC on Saturday night, Kirk Herbstreit and Chris Fowler calling the game. I wanted, um, you know, college game day to be at the games and. You know, I wanted big time competition. My cousins all played in the NFL, Samari so role and Antro role. They went to big schools. So I um, I kind of knew that I was I wanted to go to a power five big time school. Uh, and I had 83 scholarship offers coming out as a number one rated high school player. I was looking heavily at Oklahoma, uh, Bob Stoops. They were in the national championship game quite often. I was looking at Southern Cal. Uh, this is when they were hot with Reggie Bush and Matt Miner, Lendell White. They had a really good team out there. Uh, I looked at Ohio State with Jim Trussell. I looked at um, Georgia with Mark Richt and then Texas with Mac Brown. Uh, then Penn State with Joe Paterno, too, and Charlie Weiss up in Notre Dame. So, I, you know, I had a couple schools that I was looking at, but I thought Florida State fit me best. And, um, and I thought it fit me best because they had a guy who wasn't a football player, but he was a, a national champion shot putter and a discus thrower who was an aide for then-Governor Jeb Bush, did volunteer mission work in Haiti, 4.0 student who won a Rhodes Scholarship, and he was a black guy from Tampa, Florida, named Garrett Johnson. I saw him on my visit, and my mother was like, this is the kind of guy you need to be around. Like, if you want to be like Bill Bradley, you want to be this Rhodes Scholar, this, you know, sort of true student athlete, this multidimensional kind of person, this gentleman, Garrett Johnson, is who you need to be around. And so, frankly, he was heavy. He weighed, and he wasn't even a football player. It was crazy that a non-football player weighed heavy in my football decision. Uh, I also like Bobby Bowden being my head coach. Um, Bob Stoops, Urban Meyer, you know, uh, Pete Carroll. They're all younger coaches who I thought would potentially leave their institution and go somewhere else. Maybe go to the NFL or transfer or go to another team. But Bob, Bobby Bowden had been at Florida State for 35, 36 years by the time I got there. And he had this sort of grandfather-like figure and presence to him that my parents felt comfortable, you know, uh, being led by him. He also was a Christian. I walked into his office and he had a big Bible open. He asked me to pick out my favorite Bible verse. And I looked at it and I picked out Hebrews 13, 6. Um, you know, it talks about the Lord being my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And, you know, the fact that he wanted me to talk about my Christianity Went before we talked about cover two, cover three, you know, blitzing, you know, will I get playing time, all that kind of stuff. That spoke volumes to me and my family. You know, we're a heavy Baptist family, and um, it, it was awesome. And then I love Tallahassee. The Big Bend area was a great place to be because, you know, Florida State, Tallahassee is all about their football team. But then you have all those legislators in Tallahassee that will be there, the governors, the 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 state senators, the state representatives, the judges. They're all there. And Florida is one of the most important states politically in the country. Uh, and so if you want to do anything with the community, here are some lawmakers that can help make it happen. And so I actually ended up starting a foundation when I was in college on the backs of meeting Charlie Crist. And, you know, then after him, I had a chance to meet um, Rick Scott when he was governor and some of the other lawmakers. And they helped give my foundation some money, helped found, find me some foster kids who I wanted to work with. And then next thing you know, I have one of the leading foundations for children in the state of Florida. But it all started with the connections that I was able to make outside of the football field at FSU. So that was uh, that was huge for me. That decision was a multifactorial decision and one of the best ones I've made in my life. Did you end up staying in touch with the, the shot putter? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're still very close. We text probably every other week or so. Uh, and he's awesome. He lives in Thomasville, Georgia now and he's got a family of his own. He, um, you know, when I was going to Oxford, he, you know, gave me great advice on what to do when I got over there. And now that I'm back, he serves as like not only my role model, but sort of my advisor when thinking about how to get involved in the community. He's very, very civically engaged. And so he helps me out. I just did a back to school event for inner city uh, underrepresented kids in Orlando where I live. And uh, he was instrumental in helping me think about, you know, which communities to touch and how to do it. So, yeah, Garrett and I are very close. That's my man. That's awesome. 
Yeah, when you said a, a shot putter helped make the decision, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> I never heard that before. I know, I know. He was, that's how that's how great of a man he was and is. I mean, he's my mother was like, you know, this is who you need to be. Like, stick on his hip. Where he, if he goes to the bathroom, you go too. You know, if he's going to the cafeteria, you go too. I'm like, all right, all right, that's a little bit too much. But she. How did uh, you even run into him though? On the he was on the visit. They talked about him, or he just happened so, to be there. So he had won the road scholarship and the academic staff, uh, the academic um, athletic staff, they said, you know, we think Myron Roll could possibly win a road scholarship too. So Garrett, would you mind talking to this kid? You know, even though, uh, you know, he's not a, he's not a, he's not a track runner uh, or a shot putter, but he's a kid who thinks, you know, has potential too. And so our relationship started there and, you know, it's lasted for when I met him when I was 17 and now I'm 37. So, you know, long time. I read that you got your degree in two and a half years. Was that a typo? Tell Troy what you majored in. Yeah, I, I got it in two and a half years, uh, frankly, because I um, I came in with a lot of credits from high school. I, I took a lot of AP credits. I tested out of several courses, um, even just when I got to Florida State. And I didn't leave. You know, some people leave in the summer to go home, work a job or something like that, study abroad. I said, I'm going to be on campus and lifting weights and running anyway. So I might as well take all these credits. I took 20 hours, 24 credits in the summer, 18 in the spring. I was slowed down in the, um, in the fall because we were traveling so much and obviously playing, um, you know, big time football, but I, I got busy. I got busy really quickly. And, uh, I majored in exercise science for pre-med, uh, in the honors college and, um, yeah, graduated, um, summa cum laude, uh, or sorry, magna cum laude in uh, two and a half years. And, um, you know, it also set me up because I knew that I was only going to put this, this is going to sound kind of boastful, but I knew I was only going to play three years in, in college. I, I knew after my junior year, I was going to go to the NFL. I was, uh, started as a true freshman. I was all American as a true freshman, ACC rookie of the year. Uh, I had, a, I had a, I started off really well. And my cousins who were in the NFL already, Samari with the Ravens and and trail with the Cardinals and then switched over to the Giants. Um, they were telling me how their uh, GMs were talking about me and ready to draft me. And so I knew it was only going to be three years. So I wanted to have my degree in hand uh, and, and get it going. But, you know, I, um, I won the Rhodes Scholarship, which sort of puts a, a detour on that decision. Uh, I wasn't able to go to the NFL right away and uh, spent my year studying medical anthropology at Oxford University. Um, and then came back to the NFL a year and a half later and got drafted, as you said, in the sixth round. So I uh, got there, but uh, just in a, in a little bit of a different route than I was expecting. After winning the Rhodes Scholarship, you decided to delay the NFL route, which is rare for someone as highly touted as you were. Instead, you went to Oxford and studied medical anthropology. That sounds fascinating. What was your favorite lecture? What was your favorite reading? Yeah, I think uh, my favorite reading was um, on Rene Descartes, uh, you know, great philosophers who would um, talk about the personal narrative of patients. Uh, you know, basically, you are what you think that you are, essentially. But he would talk about how important it was to give patients a, a story, right? Um, when patients come into the operating room or into hospitals, they're often stripped away from their clothes. They're put into these gowns. They're taken away from their families. They're told what to do, what to say, how to say it. Uh, you all know this, right? I mean, it's just you're sort of disconnected from everything. But instead of treating patients like commodities, um, treat them like humans, like people with individual stories and personal narratives. And Rene Descartes' teaching was was heavy on that. And so I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed um, learning about the social and cultural aspects of medicine, uh, going to and studying places like Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, studying in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also Rwanda, um, learning about how these uh, local communities, these low resource settings, were choosing the local herbalists, bone setters, and you know, sort of the um, ritualistic healing and all these sort of uh, cultural healing mechanisms to find their treatments rather than the biomedical clinics that were set up by the colonialists, right? And so there was sort of that 
colonialism, that gender role, the stigmatization. There was all these sorts of things that went into low resource setting individuals and villages and small, you know, sub-Saharan Africa parts of the world, uh, developing parts of the world that, you know, talk about um, how you as a human, how you as a person find your healing. Uh, and it doesn't have to be through giving a pill, taking a pill, see you back in six months. Here's a pill, take a pill, see you back in six months. There's different ways to do it. And medical anthropology gave me sort of the gray area of medicine that really, really took a hard, deep dive and a hard look at um, some of these cultures, some of these traditions, some of these customs, some of these uh, individuals uh, and, and their thoughts and their sort of approaches towards medicine, the intersection of that that medical process and their lives, their special, unique lives. So I thought it was fantastic. It was a great way to um, support the neurosurgical training that I knew I wanted to get once I finished in the NFL and once I finished medical school. So now I, I'm a neurosurgeon that knows how to operate on brain tumors and aneurysms and spinal cord deformities and spinal cord tumors. But I'm also a neurosurgeon that knows you know, how people in different parts of the world think, feel, how they take their healing process, how to talk to them through dif difficult situations. Even when you introduce them to a biomedical clinic or a big hospital like Johns Hopkins or like when I was at Harvard, um, you know, how to get them through those processes without um, disrespecting uh, or diminishing their culture and their perspectives. I think that's super important. You returned from Oxford after being drafted in the sixth round by the Tennessee Titans. Were you able to stay in football shape while you were at Oxford? Did you watch the draft while you were over there? Yeah, I, uh, I was able to stay in shape a little bit. Uh, my brother, one of my brothers, McKinley, the one that's right above me, he came with me to England and uh, he was there living uh, and trained me every morning. I'd go to Ifley Road, which is a sports complex at Oxford and uh, train with him, you know, uh, five o'clock, 5.30 in the morning and then go to class around seven. Uh, it was it was great work, and uh, we had everything, all the equipment that you could want, sort of the weight belts and the weight uh, vest and the parachutes and, you know, um, the timers, the cones, uh, the resistance bands. And then I also played a little rugby when I was there, too. Uh, not a lot because I didn't, I didn't want to lose my teeth, uh, but played enough to kind of keep my endurance at a, uh, a peak level. My coaches at Florida State would send me some game film. So I was able to keep watching film and keep my mind invested in sport. And then, um, you know, the NFL would play sometimes in England uh, at Wembley Stadium. I, I went to London and watched that game and met some of the guys there. And You know, it was just fun to kind of keep my my interest in football while studying and being a Rhodes Scholar. But uh, did the best I could. Came back to the United States and played in the Senior Bowl. An interesting thing about the Senior Bowl was I got invited off the strength of being a very good player my junior year, right? I mean, I didn't even play a whole year, but they were like, you know, you were an All-American. I think you're still good, so let's give you a shot. I started off that week in the Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama, as a third-team safety uh, because they didn't know if I was any good anymore. I mean, I took a year off. They were like, he's not serious about football. Who knows? He's been eating fish and chips and bangers and mash and all that <laughs> terrible food in England. Who knows if he still can do it? So um, started off that week third-team. By the end of the week – uh, by game time, I was starting. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, the kind of effort and the kind of focus we put in. And so had a great senior bowl, then got invited to the combine You know, had a good combine, had my pro day, had a great pro day. Uh, and uh, that's what got me back on the radar to uh, get drafted in the sixth round. I mean, was there, there must've been a lot of pressure to not, to not go to England, to not go to Oxford and do that. Right. I mean, a lot of pressure. Was I was, I was even hearing from NFL teams that were telling me, uh, you know, you're abandoning your team by going to Oxford and not playing your senior year. You're the best player in the team. You know, how does it, how will the other guys take it that, you know, the best player is going to study and he's not going to play? Um, and they were serious. They asked my question seriously. I said, you know, <laughs> for so long, I've been hearing, oh, you got to be a student athlete. You got to be a student athlete. You got to get good grades to play football, right? Like you got to do both things. And then I do it at a level that's high. And it's like, oh, well, you're too smart. You're doing too much, right? Because <laughs> We don't know if we can control you. I heard from an NFL GM one time told me that um, you may think too much on the field. Like if we're asking you to run through a wall, 
because you're smart, because you want to be a brain surgeon, because maybe one day you can be a president or something like that, you may not run through that wall. You may try to protect yourself. Whereas another guy who has no other option, uh, who needs this, who may not be as talented as you, he's going to run through that wall and do everything we say, because this is all he's got. He's going to give it everything he's got. And I, and I couldn't stand that narrative. And I could never shake that when I got to the NFL. It was always, he's too smart. He's a thinker. He's not going to pull the trigger. He's going to leave. So let's not invest money in him. You know, let's not give him a high, a big contract because we're not sure if he's going to stick around. He can do so many other things. He has so many other options. It was very, very frustrating because all my teammates were telling me from Troy Palomalu to Larry Foote to Vince Young to Chris Johnson uh, to Ike Taylor, uh, all of them were like, hey, you know, Ryan Clark, like you can ball. Like you are playing very well. And I'm like, well, my teammates are saying it. You know, the position coaches are saying it, but the GM, the front office individuals, uh, they were not ready to uh, to invest in me. And it was difficult. And so stepping away from the NFL – after those three years, two with the Titans, one with the Steelers, it was um, it was challenging. And um, but the way I look at it now, um, honestly, I look at it like this. I say, you know, maybe God was protecting me from something. Right. Like I, I only played three years. Maybe he was protecting my hand so that I can go and be a pediatric neurosurgeon. I can go and maybe help heal people in a different realm. Um, maybe he was protecting my brain. Um, you know, maybe he was. You know, making sure that I had just enough money so I can pay for medical school. Right. Maybe he was, you know, doing something for me in a background that I just wasn't sure about uh, so that now I can try to help people in this this way. Maybe he was getting me to my next career of being a neurosurgeon so that I can do the science of neurosurgery. But at the same time, I also can help with concussions and traumatic brain injury in football. So I can have my um, I can have my foot in both the scientific world, and then also the athletic world that I've loved my entire life. Maybe he was, maybe he was doing that. And, and I have to imagine too, being such a high recruit, you probably had a lot of people kind of testing you and you had family in the NFL already. You probably got tested a lot um, socially, on the football field, kind of all of the above. I'd have to imagine at uh, Florida State. And, you know, on top of that, on top of the family connections and being a big recruit, you're also this straight A student. So I remember I read something years ago um, where you were talking about how people, I don't want to say tested you, but I guess they did. They tested you because they thought, oh, well, he's smart so that he can't be tough or he can't be that athletic, right? Oh, yeah. I uh, actually got in a couple of fights uh, in college because of that. And uh, one was actually like a sanctioned boxing match. Um, <laughs> you know, it was like after workouts, we were running 110 yard sprints. And then our strength coach said, okay. We don't have to run anymore if two of you guys fight. And uh, so he called out this big, bad fullback we had, Marcus. And, um, you know, Marcus, like, super you know, rocked up, muscled up guy, like 240 pounds, like, just all muscle, just all, like, shredded. And uh, he was like, all right, I'm fighting, I'm fighting. And then he said, okay, Marcus, you can pick who you want to fight. And I was like, he's not going to pick me, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm the smart guy, you know. I don't cause any trouble. He was like, I want to roll. I'm like, really? This was an example of <laughs> I want to test this guy's manhood, right? Let me see if he's, you know, up up to the stuff, right? Like see if he's got it. Little did Marcus know I'm a great preparer. And I didn't think he was going to call me. But if he did, I was going to be ready. So nights before, when I heard that we may be boxing, I was watching like highlights of Sugar Ray Leonard, Mike Tyson, I'm shadow boxing in my room. I even got me like a, a speed bag and I'm hitting it. And I'm, he did not know I was prepared for that. So when we get out there and fight, I whooped his, you know what? I beat him up so bad. And then after that, all my teammates were like, oh, you're good now. You want to come to the club with us? You want to come to the party with us? You want to come and hang out with us? Like, you're tough now. And I was like, I just had to beat up one of your, your guys. And then now I get sort of initiated into the team because I'm smart, but now I'm also tough because I can fight. And I beat up, you know, one of the biggest, baddest guys on the team. So it was a, it's crazy. It was a test for sure. It was like a rite of passage, but I passed it. Marcus didn't know that I was prepared for him, but I was, and uh, it all worked out. So did that, when you got to the NFL, did that kind of stop? It sounds like you were mentioning before. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't say I was test physically in that respect, but I, I thought that a lot of my coaches and teammates just love to talk about the other stuff with me than football. So let's, for instance, I had a chance to go to um, 
to England, um, oh, sorry, not to England, to Congo again and Rwanda uh, with President Bill Clinton. Uh, I spoke at his uh, library in Little Rock, Arkansas, and then I spoke at uh, the Aspen Institute with him, and then I went to Austin, Texas, and I spoke for his Clinton Global Initiative. So he and I became very close, and he said, okay, I want you, I want Ashley Judd, I want Jeff Gordon, I want Lauren Bush, I want all of you guys, Usher, I want you guys to come with us, come with me to East Africa uh, to fight sexual violence there. A lot of women are being raped uh, by soldiers, by just men in the community. You know, let's go and advocate. Let's go and try to direct policy. Let's go see if we can help. And uh, and I went over there during our lockout year, and it made news that I went to Africa with President Clinton. And then uh, when uh, I came back, everybody was like, "Tell me about Bro Clinton. Tell me this. Tell me about that. Tell me about this." And I'm like, "Okay, I'll tell you about this." But then after, can we talk about the man-to-man coverage that we want to do against Peyton Manning when Reggie Wayne is going to run this route? Uh, and they're like, "No, no, let's not worry about that. Let's talk about you know Bill Clinton. Talk about this." When the movie Concussion came out, you know, they want to talk about brain injury with me. It just I I appreciated them for thinking of me and my intellect as someone who can opine on these conversations or sorry, these topics very well. But I also just wanted to be another one of the guys. right? I just wanted to play football. Uh, I've been doing it my entire life. And so I wanted to when I'm in the stretch line, my coach comes up and talks to me and asks me about Bill Clinton. But then he goes to the guy next to him and says, you know, I need you to blitz a little harder when you're coming off the edge. I want you to do that. I'm like, well, what do I got to do? Like, tell me what I need to do as far as my blitz is concerned. So that was um, it was sort of like a double-edged sword. I enjoyed it, but then I was like, oh, I want to just be an athlete right here, right now in this moment. And then when this all football stuff's done, then I can go and be the quote-unquote scholar and the neurosurgeon that I want to be later on. But it was tough. It was tough to kind of mitigate that for sure. I was going to ask you about that. Your football career with the Tennessee Titans and then the Pittsburgh Steelers really didn't work out. I don't know you that well, but I suspect that your heart wasn't fully in it. The reason I say that is because you're a determined guy who has accomplished everything you set your mind to. You were doing amazing things off the field and had medical school waiting for you, which is much more important and permanent. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of always knew I had medical school uh, as the option, not sort of as the backup option, but as the next stage, the next step. Not everyone is going to play like Tom Brady forever. Um, so, yeah, but but it, it, I did feel like a bit of a failure, uh, Tim. I'm not going to lie. I felt like um, I let my family down. I felt like I let a lot of the Bahamas down because they were expecting me to be the next you know, big football star that comes from the island. I, I felt like I let, um, you know, my my teammates who knew I was good. I, one of my best friends growing up in Galloway, he, he would always say to me, he's like, man, you're the best football player I've ever seen with my own eyes. Uh, and it's crazy how, um, you know, you're not able to, to get on like, like you have, you know, you've been successful at every, every turn. And so that was, um, that was certainly a challenge and feeling failure was, um, it was hard, you know, when you're young, even though you knew you set up your life, to move into another career, it's still, it, football still permeated everything that I did. How I ate, my sleep patterns, my friendship circles, uh, the, how I dressed, um, what I did on a day to day basis, what I put in my body, um, places I didn't go because I knew that as a football player, it wouldn't look good if I went. I mean, just all of these things, they really informed all of my decisions. And now that's done. And now I have to move into something else. That I knew I wanted to do, but just wasn't sure when God was going to say it was my time. So, um, you know, the best way to make God laugh is have a well laid out plan. And uh, I, uh, you know, the plan was to play for nine, 10 years and then go to medical school. But three years in, gone and uh, and then, you know, moved on to uh, to medicine. And it was uh, one of the best decisions I've ever made, for sure. How did you get over that feeling or handle that feeling? I had very, played football at a very different level than you guys that I played at, at Syracuse, but never got. You know, didn't even get on the field, never got to the pros, anything like that. But at the end of my career, I had to choose between, you know, trying trying one more year or starting law school. I had an academic scholarship, so I kind of had to choose one. And I ended up going to law school, and I had this feeling. I had this basically what you described, but again, probably to a lesser degree. It wasn't the number one recruit and wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't uh, in the NFL. But I still I had that feeling. And, um, you know, even when I was in law school, I'd have dreams at night where I was playing in the NFL or not in the NFL, playing football. I still, even to this day, will have dreams where I'm playing football and I haven't played in 
10 plus years. Is there anything you did that made you, I don't know, get over that? Or do you still kind of have that as like almost a chip on your shoulder? Yeah. You know, I think for me, I, uh, I leaned heavily on my family. Um, I went back to the core, went back to the group that would love me if I wasn't a great football player. I would love me if I wasn't, um, you know, on ESPN making highlights, um, would love me regardless, right? Just unconditionally. Um, and would also feed me some of my favorite food too. Uh, my mother makes uh, this peas and rice, which is one of our uh, staples in the Bahamas. It's pigeon peas and brown rice. And uh, it's like that comfort, good food that's just like, it puts me in back into the mood of being a child again. And and uh, it's, it's delicious, but it also has those memories attached to it that sort of awakens uh, that mesial temporal lobe, the amygdala and the hippocampus that says, you know, these were the good times and, and here I am uh, eating with dinner with my parents and, and uh, you know, feeling uh, protected and not vulnerable and exposed. So I think leaning on my family was huge for me. Prayer was huge for me. Uh, and, you know, realizing that, um, like I said, God had a different, different route for me and knowing that we put in a lot of work before getting to the NFL um, for this exact moment. And now you just need to be reminded of that work that you have put in uh, and don't lose sight of that, right? Uh, don't just give it up. You, 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 you did extra study hall. You did, you saw your teachers during office hours. You, um, you know, would uh, stay up late at night uh, to finish assignments and to make sure they were done correctly. You did extra research on human mesochymal stem cells and saw how they proliferated in different microenvironments while you're an undergrad. You started leadership academies. You were doing mentorship. You were reading different books. You did all this work, not for it to be for naught, right? Like you did it so that it could get you a door that you can just open. Now it's time to open it. And I just needed a little bit of that support uh, for my family to help buttress it. And also uh, that sort of faith and belief that, um, things are going to be all right. and It's going to work itself out. I totally agree with you on family and faith, getting you through situations like that. Everyone faces different moments in their life where doors close and they aren't sure how to handle it. You can never go wrong relying on your core group and religion. On a more positive note, where and how did you meet your wife? I saw she is a doctor herself, a pediatric dentist. Yeah, she's, uh, she's amazing. Latoya and I met through a uh, Black Doctors Network. It's, um, you know, it's a group of Black doctors, pharmacists, uh, nurses, dentists, physicians, um, and uh, we're all a part of this group. And they highlighted her. They told her story uh, and they showed a picture of her. One, her picture was gorgeous. I said, this woman <laughs> is beautiful. <laughs> but two, um, you know, she told a story about her faith. She told a story about not getting into dental school three different times. She applied to a place called Meharry in Nashville, an all black um, dental school, and she got denied three different times, but never stopped, never quit. And then on the fourth time, tried to get in and they waitlisted her. But then she got into University of Tennessee. And then when she got into University of Tennessee, then Meharry reversed and said, oh, no, no, you can actually come to, to us now. And she was like, no, I'm not going there. You guys denied me three to four times. I'm going to University of Tennessee, and she ended up doing so well at Tennessee, becoming one of the top dentists in her class, uh, becoming one of the best pediatric dentists in all of the state of Florida and uh, and even the country, and just done so, so remarkably well. Now she's an owner of her own practice. And so anyway, I saw that focus. I saw that resilience, that toughness. I saw her faith. Uh, she talked about her family, too. And as I mentioned, you know, she was very attractive. So uh, I asked the guy who actually wrote the article to, to put us in touch, and he did. And, you know, next thing you know, we're texting and then calling and FaceTime and then visiting. And then um, a year and a half later, we're married. So it just uh, it all worked out, you know. And then we got married in December of 2019. Late December of 2019, she calls me and says, um, yeah, you know, I'm a couple weeks pregnant. And I was like, whoa. And uh, she said, and not only one, there's two in there. So then we had our first set of twins in August of 2020. And, uh, and then we had another set of twins two years later in uh, April of 2022. So we have uh, two sets of twins, oh all under gosh. the age of four. 
And um, <laughs> it's been it's been a journey and a bit of a circus at times. But uh, she is a remarkable woman. She is my best friend, love of my life, and uh, an outstanding mother. And she's been holding it down because we haven't lived together. When I was in Boston in residency at Mass General Hospital, uh, she was in Orlando with the kids. Uh, my parents were in Orlando. Her mom was living with us, but I wasn't there. And so I was going back and forth on weekends when I wasn't on call in Boston. And uh, it was tough. It was tough on her, tough on me, tough on our relationship, and tough on the kids not to see daddy all the time. But now I'm you know, done in Harvard, and I, I'm full-time in Florida, and I'm able to see them every every week, uh, every other day, essentially. And uh, it's been it's been a blessing. So, yeah, LaToya is – she's amazing. Superwoman. Two sets of twins is more impressive than three years in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's unbelievable. And today was the first day of school for the older twins, and uh, they – uh, they they had a had a ball. They had a ball. They were playing. They were, you know, dressed up to the nines, and they, they looked wonderful and they had a great time. So uh, it was great. It was awesome. You have led a blessed life, my friend. I know your Christian faith is extremely important to you, and I wondered how that came to be. I have always been a Christian, but in name only. In fact, I was lost, but now I am found. I am convinced that God has allowed me to get ALS in order to live how I was meant to live. His will be done before I live for myself and I glorified myself instead of God's son, Jesus. So when Troy came up with the idea for this podcast, I agreed to do it only if I could witness for Jesus in every episode. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. That puts a smile on my face. Um, you know, my, uh, my wife and kids and my mother, we all went to church this past Sunday. And uh, one of the scriptures uh, was that a proverb talking about leaning not on our own understanding, right? And uh, trusting God and, and acknowledge him in all of our ways. And so sometimes we have this sort of understanding of how we want things to go, uh, but we shouldn't lean on our own understanding. We should uh, put our faith and our trust in the Lord because he's kept it over and over again. And he's shown us that he's kept it uh, through scripture, through stories that he's told in our own lives, uh, in our family's lives, in people near us in their lives examples of his promise and his faith and his goodness in our life uh, continue to show. And you just have to be open to seeing it. So for me, my spiritual journey started with my parents early. Uh, we're Baptists and the Bahamas is a theocracy, essentially. So pretty much everyone has some level of faith. Uh, and ours happen to be Baptist. And we go to church every, every Sunday, Sunday school as well. Uh, I got saved when I was around 13 and um, got baptized shortly after that, gave my life to Christ, got baptized shortly after that, and uh, didn't become sin-free, as you know. I mean, I didn't, didn't stop sinning, but um, the decisions that I made were more deliberate. You know, I kept thinking about how the Lord would want me to act in this particular moment. You know, what are the good decisions I need to make uh, to be more becoming of a Christian, to be Christ-like? Um, sort of thinking about evangelizing, right? Talking about just exactly what you're doing, Tim. I mean, the fact that you're speaking about your faith on this podcast is your ministry, right? It's a way for you to evangelize and to speak about how God has worked in your life. And so through my ministry of leadership and mentoring and advocacy, but also in, in medicine, if there are moments and pockets where I can talk about my faith and how great God has been, uh, I don't shy away from it because I know he has uh, established this foundation for me. He has put wonderful people around me uh, and he has always been committed to um, you know, seeing seeing me through. Uh, just as a father wants to see his child do well and succeed, that's the kind of relationship that I feel I have uh, with my Lord and Savior. So I've I've kept it going. I think the top the toughest part, the toughest challenge I had with my faith was when I was in England at Oxford. Uh, it was a place that really, really liked to emphasize neck up, uh, cerebral intellect, and neck up sort of understanding of the world rather than sort of the spirit, the soul, and, you know, there'd be some things that seem unknown or unsure, and, uh, and you know, we can, we can um, you, you know, you didn't have to sort of have a mathematical definition about everything that happened. I, I felt challenged in that environment, but I tried to stay as strong as I could with my brothers, with Bible study that I would do virtually with friends and teammates back home, and it was very helpful. And now, as a father of four and, and a husband uh, leading my own household, I am sort of I, I, I enjoy starting my kids off in our Christian home 
getting them into Sunday school and getting them into our church services and praying with them every night and teaching them how to pray and giving them books to read about, um, you know, some of the uh, incredible characters in the Bible and getting them, getting them to learn that. That's been that's been a joy. So I appreciate you you for asking me that question. And I certainly appreciate you for doing exactly what Jesus had done, which is to spread the word and uh, and to make sure that people know that your life is a living testament of of God's purpose and plan and mission for you. Finally, I would like to invite you to brag about your wife, kids, and your parents. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for asking me that question. Um, my wife, she's from Columbus, Georgia. She is a military brat. She grew up on a military base, but was born in Germany at a military base there, uh, and then traveled all over, right? And then finally ended up in Columbus, Georgia, and that's where she grew up. Went to Tennessee State University for undergrad, and then, as I mentioned, UT for dental school. And I went to UAB for pediatric dentistry residency. Uh, she's an outstanding daughter uh, to a great woman, uh, Lisa Legrand, and um, and uh, a great sister to Lakitia Martinez. Uh, she's an awesome aunt, and you know, most importantly, a phenomenal mother. And she's done a wonderful job in our family, and and uh, I'm so so proud of her, and um, just blessed to to have her in my life. Frankly, uh, you know, not only does she encourage me uh, and uplift me. But uh, she kind of tempers me a little bit. And I have that sort of football edge to me a lot, you know, so I like to go, go, go. Like I'm like sick him and she's like, whoa, right? Like it's, I'm the sick him and she's the, like bring it back a little bit. And we kind of balance each other, right? And sometimes she's so chill. I'm like, you need to go. And uh, she's like, okay, you're right. So we're, we're a good yin and yang in that respect. But she's fantastic. My kids, Zora, Zayed, Zanzi, Zafar, uh, beautiful children, respectful polite, love each other, just you see the eyes of wonder open up whenever they read something new or see something new or encounter a new experience. It's just been a blessing. Uh, so I love them dearly. And uh, and they, you know, um, jump on me whenever I'm at home and want rides on my neck. And, uh, you know, they want to beat up on daddy. And then they say, daddy, you're so strong. I say, you're only saying that so you can beat up on me a little bit more and grab on my <laughs> leg and grab on my arm. But they are phenomenal kids and they're healthy and uh, you couldn't ask for more. So it's a wonderful thing. And then my parents are, are outstanding too. They live in Sanford, Florida, which is just a little bit north of us, maybe about 40 minutes north of us. Um, we live in Lake Nona, Orlando. So that's like Southeast Orlando and near the airport. But, um, yeah, my parents are amazing. They've been married for 53 years now, and uh, they have set the example for how to be parents. I don't have to go and read a book on how to be a parent. Just look at how my parents loved each other and raised us. And uh, it's the best blueprint for doing it in my own household. Uh, my father was, um, you know, strict uh, growing up and uh, a little bit curt. You know, he never really said, I love you. Um all the time. I know he did love me, but he never really said it out loud. My mother did. Uh, but now with my kids, his grandkids, I mean, he's dancing, he's singing. <laughs> he's like a whole new person. I was like, daddy, who are you? Who is this man that is doing all this dancing and singing? I've never seen you dance in your life. And now you're doing it with my kids. And so uh, he's got a new energy about him. And so is my mother. And it's been a blessing. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to brag on my, on my family. Uh, I think you can see how much I'm smiling, how much they mean to me, uh, how important they are to me, and um, you know how anything that I've been able to do in my life, frankly, is a testament to to them. That's uh, amazing. It sounds a lot like our our family too. It's it's really fun. Now on to our final word segment, where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? Uh, happiest moment of my life was getting married. And, uh, and and having my children, too. I think both of those, yeah. What is the biggest adversity you faced? Biggest adversity I ever had to overcome was uh, probably failing in the NFL uh, and feeling like I let a lot of people down and I wasn't maximizing my potential. Uh, it, it was very difficult. That was probably the biggest adversity, for sure. Feeling like I was leaving a part of my life that I had had a part of my life since the beginning. What are you most excited about? I'm most excited about uh, being more present as a father and as a husband now that I'm in uh, Florida as a neurosurgeon, um, seeing the kids grow up and being a part of their life. 
definitely excited about uh, continuing to build the family into the future. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? Uh, I just want to say that I appreciate, um, you know, Tim for uh, all of this, you know, for the fight. Um, it, it matters to, uh, to bring awareness to ALS, to bring uh, people together and, you know, to, um, to really advocate and, and talk about important issues and to bring people who may have a story to tell. So you're doing the good work and it, all of it has significant impact in the community. And uh, I'm just appreciative to be a part of it. Before we wrap up, uh, Dr. Roll, I promise this is the last question. One of the things that was important to us with the podcast is we wanted to have a lot of different kinds of people on with different backgrounds. We didn't want it to be only sports or only medical or only authors or, or whatnot. So um, at the end of every episode, we asked people, who are a couple of people that you know that you think we should have on as a guest? Wow. Uh, I would say um, Val Demings. Uh, she is the former U.S. Congresswoman from Orlando, Florida. She was a police officer in Orlando, went to Florida State. She is a force. Uh, I think she is remarkable. So I would say her, um, you know, she kind of jumps right out at me. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think uh, I think I, I would go with Val Demings as as uh, as somebody who one I look up to, and I would love to to hear, you know, more about her story and and what is what she's done. I I know her personally, but to hear her in this sort of setting in this platform. I think it'd be beneficial not only for me, but uh, for listeners too. That's perfect. That's a good one. Myron Roll, thank you again for joining us today. You are a role model that every kid should aspire to. And it was an honor to have you on our show. I am so impressed with everything that you've done and appreciate all of the good you're putting into the world through medicine. Uh, well, pleasure's all mine. I thank you guys very much. Appreciate that. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.